call it in the brief. So we will uh, talk about perception of space in painting. Meaning we will try to make some historical overview and to see what happened from prehistory to our days. So first illustration is the way how to construct in the easiest possible way things. Uh, something that is interesting here, even in geometry or mathematics or whatever is how to construct different things in the most simple way. So about labyrinth, they are written many papers, including topological papers published in Leonardo, including Philip's papers about that, etc., etc., with pretty sophisticated explanations. But what is the simplest labyrinth? The simplest labyrinth is just meander or spiral. So what is the goal of the labyrinth? To go from outside to the Minotaur cave. And in this case, you are going to spiral. <coughs> of course, this is a trivial solution. And after that, you can make some more complicated solutions. You can make some walls or something like that and create real labyrinth. So first, Critian labyrinth is created in this way. And what you can do? You can do just meander, meandering line. It is easier than circular. Of course, you can play with the circular. And after that, just cut some pieces. If you rotate that piece by 90 degrees, you will have your breaks, your walls, and you can lock it. Uh, this is the hand, of course. It can be left or right, and uh, what happened in prehistory? Uh, Prehistorical man uh, tried to make some testimony about his existence. And in this case, he just painted on a wall that hand. Of course, that was not hand print, but that was negative on the hand meaning just color is around hand. It was spread, let's say, in modern way. And after that, all his friends tried to do that and made some pattern. So in periodic figurative art, you have very realistic paintings of the things. And uh, uh, if you look in every book, in this case, you believe that they are something like, because Pictures in books are usually, let's say, standard size, like 10 centimeters or something like that. And if you don't see uh, in real space or copies, good copies of uh, cave paintings, you will believe that that is some normal size, but it is a normal size. So, for example, Altamira is something like, I don't know, this room. And it is, I will say, 16 chapter. So it is very hard to understand how people painted that. Also, they use it 3D, meaning they use it just some parts of the ceiling that are convex and concave, and use it namely structure of that very similar to the sculptures, and using that obtain the images of animals. So they composed that, so we don't know. It was art school. It was one artist. It was some Michelangelo. We don't know what happened at that time. <coughs> and the next thing is, of course, that composition. <coughs> and every figure fits perfectly with the other and fits perfectly with the relief of the ceiling. And after that, we have very realistic things in bone. And here you can uh, recognize some geometrical elements like two, two rhombuses. Are they eyes or viewer or whatever? We don't know. And after that, we have examples of the geometrical ornamentation. These are examples 23,000 years there before Christ, and they are birds and bracelet from Mason, Ukraine. If you develop your bracelet, meaning just if you unroll it. In this case, you will get something very similar to the patterns of Maurice Cornelius Escher. Why I say Maurice Cornelius Escher? Because Escher tried to make his metamorphosis. Metamorphosis means that you have one pattern on the left side, the other pattern on the right side, and you try, try to make continuous transformation from the left to the right. Just past the series of, let's say, topological transformations. 
pattern and after that obtain back one pattern with frogs, for example, or lizards obtain the other patterns with I don't know, birds or whatever. <coughs> In medicine, they succeeded to do a very similar thing. So if you pass from here, from the left side, you will recognize that first you have that meandering pattern, after that you have a set of zigzag lines, after that you have a set of squares, after that you have a meandering pattern, etc. So it was continuous transition. If you are trying to make continuous transition, you cannot do that let's say, randomly. You cannot make your design without sketches, without mathematical intuitive knowledge, at least intuitive. What is intuitive and what is not, this is other story. So this is kind of metamorphosis of the pattern. Uh, after that, we can try to discover mathematical origin of that, because here we recognize, in fact, geometry, we recognize the facts. And, uh, in his PhD dissertation in something like 30s, written in Ukraine, proposed the idea that everything there in that pattern is made from some square with the sets of diagonal lines. And that just simple squares are composed edge to edge, one to the other, and after that you can obtain that pattern. I call that pattern optile meaning that square I call octile. If you look in the middle of that drawing here, you can recognize square with the diagonal lines. And all the patterns, everything here, is made from similar or same things. Here, if you recognize this rectangle, please try to look at it. In this case, you recognize Optile. So once when you see that element, after that you see, see it for, for all your life. This is something connected with the optical illusion and some jitsa. So why I call it Optile? Because it is a very popular in pop art. So namely Reginald Neal makes square of three and it is made from Optiles. And the fact is just use the squares, very small squares, and after that they will start to flicker and dazzle and something like that. So they will produce very strange visual effects. <coughs> they are very popular in the Celtic art, and Celtic people call them key patterns, because they are going like uh, key one to the other part. And uh, uh, they use it that as a charm against enemies, simply because they produce and of course, in modern painting, you can recognize combination between labyrinths and meanders and similar things. Also, this is the work for our students. So this is Miloš Adamovic, first generation here in FALFIT, uh, Faculty of uh, Information Technologies, in design section, and he made that composition. It is very interesting that everything here is rectilinear, so you have no curved lines. Uh, next thing, how that things originated, meaning how they are produced for the first time. Probably they are produced by mating, plating, basketry, and similar kind of technologies. So on the left side you can find something that is, let's say, from the middle of nowhere, meaning from Amazonia in Brazil, and this is meandering pattern, mainly in basketry. Uh, about meanders and the spiral patterns in basketry, you can read beautiful book by Paulus Gerdes, who analyzes the uh, I will not just speak in French, because the title is in French. I, I hope that it is translated now in English. Of course, after that, people produced also keramic things. So this is uh, the pattern from the El Aini Mosque in Cairo. Uh, you have no reason to make in ceramics basketry, but what you are doing, you are copying basketry, and after that you are producing keramic tiles, they are absolutely the same as 
basket. So this is kind of proof that basketry was the origin. In Greece, it was very strange things on the pillars. On the pillars, you can discover something like, uh, let's say, small spheres or small circles or small hexagons or something like that, that are in relief. What was that? That was, in fact, memory on wooden pillars that have something, some nails on them. And after that, they copied that in stone. Of course, there was no nail in stone. So they copied here basketry patterns, they copied here that kind of patterns in other media. And this is another proof. Left is from Vincha, wonderful place from Serbia. Next is Tisa, Hungary, Madastra, Armenia, all that part meaning connected with the rivers, with the Danube, uh, and that part of, uh, of Europe has wonderful Neolithic, uh, Neolithic uh, uh, ceramics. And in all of that things, you can di discover that in fact there are textile patterns. So this is again copying of the textile patterns, and you can recognize that it's real textile copied on plants. And of course, after that, you have different geometrical transformations here. Uh, this is especially interesting for me, very, very small piece here, because it is composed from two octiles. I mentioned it before, octiles. In fact, the author of that uses that as a logo. In Vincha, you can recognize, uh, I will show you. Oh, good, perfect. Look at that. It is logo. This is explanation how I made that kind of patterns. Uh, of course, you don't expect logos in that time. Also, uh, they have no journals how to make weaving, plating, or something like that. So they publish it, they works on the walls and they transfer them to the stone. So this is Midla Palace from Mexico Zapata culture, and you can see different textile patterns. Everything here is from textile, and after that you can see them in stone. Uh, in, uh, nowadays, it happens very, uh, this pattern, especially this one, you have seen two minutes ago in the ceramics. So this is pure textile pattern that is transferred to ceramics, to stone, to other media. And in uh, nowadays, it happened a very strange circle. Meaning, something was transferred for the first time from basketry or textile, let's say, <coughs> to the stone. Now, people living in uh, Mexico are copying that and making things in textile for tourists. So circle is closed. And we have Neolithic ranks for different parts of the Europe, including the Neolithic ranks, <coughs> uh, including Neolithic stone sculptures from Levenskivir in Serbia. Uh, this is very interesting place because this is the first example in the history of art when you have a large Neolithic sculptures. Usually Neolithic sculptures are of that size. This is half meter. This is discovery by Professor Srejovic from Serbia. And you have sculptures by Harry Moore. Let's go to the modern art. So you can see Moore working on one, one of his sculpture, and you can see in the left corner the other sculpture. Uh, which of them you believe that is earlier in your work? Okay, 5,000 years before Christ. Vadastra Romania, this one. Art school in Egypt. <coughs> and we will try to explain why Egypt people made that kind of painting. So there is a row of frontality. What they tried? They tried to represent things in the most objective way. And if they are representing things, in this case, of course, 
you can represent I in, from the front, and you can represent the face from the pro profile. So you will compose two ways of viewing things in a space in order to represent them in the most objective way. When I say most objective way, you can see here the uh, Osiris uh, with the pool with the trees. <coughs> of course, uh, first explanation, and in many books about uh, history of art, you can find explanation that this naive painting or something like that, that Egyptians have been very naive. But modern engineers working at the technical factories or whatever are not very naive. What they are doing, if you are making a plan or sketch for some design for that chair or whatever, in this case, some planes, they will rotate 90 degrees and show them in the best way. And after that, the masters will produce from their drawings appropriate things. They will not just show you that the chair in perspective or as a painting. They will show you the plan. What is the plan? This is the plan of that swimming pool. So, here you have pool. This is a rectangle. After that, you have trees around the pool. How you can see in the characteristic way tree? In this way rotate the plane. So you have that joke that you have two concentric circles and after that the question is what is that? Mexican sitting under some ground. So uh, <coughs> this is the way how to avoid Mexican sitting under the ground. And uh, here you can recognize the same idea. First of course Egyptians know that walls of buildings exist but they show what is inside the building. They like it to show what is inside. And they just make that <laughs> transparent. After that, there is Dante with the two bags. How to show that he has two bags? Rotate one, and in this case you will see the other side. And third is Pharaoh, Agnaton and his wife Nefertiti. Try to recognize Nefertiti. And be sure that Agnaton has no four hands. Okay? <laughs> After that we have... <laughs> okay. After that we have some Byzantine painting, some Babylonian Assyrian painting, and this is something similar to the comics, to the modern <laughs> books of... comic books or something like that. So everything is shown in stripes. So they are level and there is hierarchy in the levels. So most important things in the front, in the lower level, after that more distant thing in other levels and everything. So they are level from the perspective. In Greece there exists local perspective. What means local perspective? Everything is fine and uh, everything is locally fine. So if you look at uh, Kentaur or that fighter or whatever, in this case you will see that uh, everything is drawn correctly. But if you look some, uh, let's say, painting connected with the architecture, showing city or something like that, they didn't know about perspective. So perspective is, of course, discovered by the Renaissance, but in Greece there existed, let's say, preconditions for that. Uh, the reason why Greek people not discover perspective is that they have been thinking two-dimensionally. So, this is the Zark theorem on the left side. This is the basic of the projective geometry. And this is, of course, free theorem. Meaning, you have two half planes and you have their common lines. So, this is one half plane. This is the other half plane, and this is just the error, and this is that line that the two uh, things intersect. And you have, of course, perspective and, pro and projective connectivity between triangles. This is Euclid porism. Absolutely equivalent thing, absolutely the same drawing. But Desar understood that three dimensionally, Euclid understood that two dimensionally. So this is two-dimensional theorem, and this is the reason 
I will not say this is the reason, it's too strong, maybe, but this is the reason why Greek didn't discover perspective. This is based on perspective. And after that, we have inverse perspective in Byzantine painting, in the Russian painting, in East Orthodox Church. And you have counter perspective. So, counter perspective explanation is that you like to see things let's say, from the left and from right. You have the uh, like to have some stereoscopic vision. And in this case, of course, you can obtain something like that. So this is the view of that cube from the one side and from the other side, and united together the final form. So this is one of the possible explanations that it is a attempt of the stereoscopic vision in two-dimensional plane. And now we are coming to the question, what we see? We see retinal projection. Retinal projection is two-dimensional. So, this means that all the lines, including disjoint lines, including the yellow lines that are not connected together, are giving absolutely the same projection. And what we are doing from that projection, we are trying to reconstruct 3D space. So we need to make a choice if you have that as the result, what was the origin? Of course, this is infinite number of possible objects. So this is very, very complicated visual process and we cannot talk about visual perspective, we can talk about visual thinking. This is our term, and I fully agree with that term. Of course, visual thinking is connected with our experience, with many other things. So, we are in the situation that we are like that lizard. We have two-dimensional image. After that, they are trying to go to three-dimensional space. We are trying to have impression about three-dimensional space. Of course, several things are helpful, meaning uh, first, uh, stereoscopic vision, second, we are permanently a little bit moving, we are changing our point of view, and this is the one of the preconditions for three-dimensional vision. Otherwise, we will have big problems with the visual illusions and uh, uh, not one-to-one -one correspondency between the original and the image. <coughs> And we have Pompeian painting. In Pompeian painting, you have something that is uh, very similar to the perspective. After that, you have intuitive perspective. If you look here, everything is at the first glance okay. This is panoramic view, and nothing is okay. So, if you make intersection lines of the parallels, in this case, you will get a set of let's say, random points. Meaning, they are trying to, they intuitively understood that there is something there. But they are not sure that it's perspective. And after that, we have discovery of the perspective, we have our theater, we have Paolo Cello, we have theoretical concept of that, Leonardo paintings, and everything. <coughs> And Leonardo introduced one more thing, it is aerial perspective. Meaning that things are look more clear if they are in front and uh, uh, different in the, if they are in back. So this is another kind of perspective, another kind of representing three-dimensional space, it is aerial perspective. And after that people, people started to play with that. So they made space visualism. Next thing, the next step was light. When I say light, I mean Impressionism. Impressionism was study of light. So in fact, effects of the light on the object. So Monet painted the same cathedral every hour. Ten paintings, changes of that cathedral thanks to the light. So this is not subjective impression, this is not Impressionism, this is just objective study of life that 
influence of light. This influence of light is also connected with the theory of colors, closely connected to discoveries of the theory of colors. So that was what we heard yesterday from Jerry about RGB code and something like that. People in Impressionism discovered that they can make painting from pixels. And they can make painting from pixels of other colors. So namely, combining that pixels in our eye and in our brain, we are getting appropriate colors. So everything here is made from pixels of colors. And of course, the effect was pretty attractive. Because, for example, if you are uh, making uh, some crazy experiment, one of my friends made that kind of things, she colored the windows, uh, all windows in her room in red. What is the effect? The shadows would be green. And after that, we have perspective, perceptive perspective. This means that uh, geometry, real geometry of our view, viewing, thanks to the curvature of retina and many other things, are is in fact non Euclidean geometry. In the 20th century, uh, one of the most important things that happened is the discovery of non Euclidean geometry. Uh, 2000 years from Euclid to our days, people tried, you know, 20th century, people tried to, discuss, to uh, prove Euclid's fifth postulate. It was interesting that all the axioms that Euclid formulated uh, are absolutely clear and simple. Meaning, for example, you have two points, and that two points uniquely determine one line. Okay. Children will understand that. And fifth postulate was formulated in the following way. If you have one line, and you have two intersecting lines, and if you extend that two lines to infinity, in this case, that two lines will intersect in, on that side that the sum of the angle is less than two right angles. This is original version of the fifth postulate. So this is long story. Of course, if you have long story in mathematics and you have all postulates as very short and very elegant, you believe that maybe you can prove that, in this case delete it, and you will have a small set of postulates. And people attempt that do something like 2,000 years. After that, if you cannot prove that, try to disprove. Meaning, try to see what will happen if you not accept this postulate. And I will, I will make some drawing because I think that is easier way to, to see that than on slides. The proof will be based on a symmetry. As Dirk told yesterday, we have one line, we have a point, and we have perpendicular. So this is something like half a cross, and everything is mirror symmetrical, so everything that happens on the left side will happen on the right side. Then we construct lines intersecting that. In one moment, it will appear line that not intersect that. Not because this uh, drawing is finite. It will just not intersect that. If you, we continue that line to infinity. Everything that happened on the left side will happen on the right side. Question. Are the two lines identical or not? Why they you leave? So, this is the fifth and, of course, if that two lines are different, in this case, all lines between them will also not intersect that line. And this is the basic of not new Euclidean geometry. Uh, it was proved by Polyai, by Lobachevsky, that this geometry is valid, meaning that it works in the same good way as Euclidean geometry. So this was discovered in the geometry. After that, uh, we are talking now about visualization, mathematics, and use of 
pictures in mathematics and graphics in mathematics and something like that. That was something that was forbidden from the time when non-Euclidean geometry discovered till something like 60s or something like that. People just say, don't use in geometrical books, don't use in the mathematical books any drawing because drawings are misleading. From drawing we will say, but they are sure identical lines. How you cannot believe in that and something like that. Now we have experience of Bolya Lobachevsky, that kind of phenomena and everything, and we can again use visualization. Of course, remembering that visualization is not true. So every time when I wrote in my paper, you can see from my drawing or something like that, my colleague Radmila wrote, pictures prove nothing. So, we have examples of that perspective in Cezanne painting. Cezanne discovered that also in absolutely other way. And we have that in paintings of, for example, Pierre Bonnard. So you have the body that is, of course, not in linear perspective, that is much longer than usual. After that, we are talking about principles of continuity. So, this is visual thinking, and this is the way how to understand space objects. And the other thing is cubism. Uh, 20th century is, in fact, time of polycentrism. What means polycentrism? In the Renaissance time, we have a first uh, uh, change of the point of view. When I say change of the point of view, People before Renaissance believe it, uh, if you have a vision in optics, in this case that you have some, let's say, impulses or rays or something, coming from your eye to the object. After Renaissance, we have the opposite way. We have reflection of light and we see the object. The next thing is attempt to see one object for several points at the same time. And this is polycentrism. Uh, we have, it is interesting that we have that polycentrism not only in the art, we have in science, we have in everything. We have polyvalent logic. Polyvalent logic means that you don't have two values, true or false, but you have continuity between 0 and 1. You have probability. In music, you have polyrhythmics. In, for example, Stravinsky, Prokofiev especially, you can find polyrhythms, change of different kinds of rhythms. And polytonality, change of tonality. Usually, all tonal music was monotonal, meaning in one tonality without big changes or with changes with modulation. But now we have polytonality. In a similar way, we have, for example, in art, cubism, where we have that kind of polycentrism. Attempt to view things uh, from a different point of view. Similar thing happened in Einstein theory of relativity because, uh, again, we have different systems. And every coordinate system, every let's say, point in movement is different from the other. Okay, I think that is finished at my time. 